Well, Father, we're ready for the word tonight. Can I hear an amen? amen? We thank you for your word. Father, I speak strength into bodies that may be tired from working today. I speak focus into our mind and our spirits tuned to the wavelength of the Holy Spirit. And we will be hearers of your word. We'll be doers of your word. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. And God's people said amen. 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 Well, we're in Romans chapter 8. And excited about what the Lord is doing. We're all the way down past Romans 8.31. And we're going to start with the fourth question tonight we're asked. But just just brief review. And you don't have to go back, Katie. You don't have to go back to the other side, the other slides. But here's what we're covering right now. Six questions and answers in Romans 8.31 through 39. And the first one was this. What shall we then say to these things? Romans 8, 31. And we talked about the importance of what we say as, as opposed to what we just think. Number two, if God be for us, who can be against us? And we talked about that. Number three, last week we dealt with how shall God with Jesus not freely give us all things? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I was in prayer with several pastors today here at the church. They're coming here, and we're meeting together every Wednesday at 930, pastors from around the area, and we're, we've uh, invited a select group, and we're keeping it small, not because we want to exclude anybody, but there are several of these small groups of pastors significantly and strategically placed that are meeting every week and the pastors of the Ozarks are praying together for revival. And we have a strategy in mind. We have tactics in mind. We are an army. Amen? And we're not going to bury our wounded. And uh, incidentally, we will leave no man or woman behind. Not in this army. Not in the kingdom of God. I shouldn't have talked about that. That pushes another button. So relax, Brother Mike, relax. But we've been praying. And I shared with them a little bit of the Smith Wigglesworth prophecy and vision that he gave to Lester Summerall. In fact, he gave it also publicly. And I, I gave you a little bit of it last week. And we talked about it. But let me just repeat some of that. And then we'll get into number four tonight. The last days are a time for the true people of God to engage in extravagant asking. Say those two words. Extravagant asking. Up to this present time, the Lord's word is for us. Hitherto you have asked nothing. Surely you people that have been asking great things from God for a long time, would be amazed if you entered into it with clear knowledge that it is the Master, it is Jesus, who has such knowledge of the mightiness of the power of the Father, of the joint union with Him, that nothing is impossible for you to ask. Surely it is He only who would say, Hitherto you have asked nothing. So God means me, Smith Wigglesworth is speaking here, to press you another step forward. Begin to believe on extravagant asking. Did you get that? Begin to believe on extravagant asking. Believing that God is pleased when you ask large things. And I love the phrase Wigglesworth uses, extravagant asking. We talked about it last week. It means ask for more than is necessary, exceeding the bounds of reason, going beyond what is deserved, and wandering outside of the boundaries. And uh, we were praying together today, the pastors in the prayer room, and uh, the Lord came upon us. And I gave a couple of prophetic words to a couple of the pastors. They reciprocated to other pastors. And we were moving in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the Lord reminded me of this. 
and I shared it with them. Folks, it's time for us to believe for the largest manifestation of miracles, signs, wonders, manifestations, demonstrations of the Spirit of God. It is time for us to get out of the comfort normal and go to God's next new supernormal. In fact, that's what we're talking about next week at GOE. So that was the last question. Number four, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Come on, say that with me. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? That's Romans chapter 8, verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Let me give you a transliteration of it. Who shall call in on the carpet, arraign, call to account, or accuse God's called out ones, since God has already declared them not guilty and demonstrated that they are righteous. Sounds like the Holy Spirit's a little upset at the enemy, doesn't it? The Bible says Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Let me read that to you again. In fact, it's up there. Let's read it together. Ready? Who shall call in on the carpet, arraign, call to account, or accuse God's called out one. Stop right there. Do you know you're a God called out one? Every one of you are. It's called the ecclesia. We're called out. We're called out. That's what we are. Jesus said, you didn't choose me. I chose you and ordained you that you would bring forth much fruit. How many glad you're a called out one? So what he's saying in the first part of this is, Tell me who has the right to mess with God's called out ones. I like those words, to call in on the carpet. Come on, some of you have memories of the principal's office. Who has the right to call you in on the carpet? Or arraign, bring you before a court. Or call to account or accuse God's called out ones. Since God, come on, let's pick up reading again, ready? Since God has declared them not guilty and demonstrated that they are righteous. Who has a right to be an accuser of God's people? And the Bible says, the answer is, God has declared you not guilty. God has shown you to be righteous. You have a lawyer on earth, it's the Holy Spirit, and you have a lawyer in heaven, it's Jesus at the right hand of the Father. And we're not talking about, now don't try to use this verse, if you're driving through Branson West and get caught going 15 or 20 miles over the speed limit. And it, you, 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 you can't use this verse. Don't look at the police officer and says, who do you think you are to call me in on the carpet? Or call me in on the court. Don't you know I'm God? No, no, no. That's not, he's, he's not told we're supposed to obey the laws of the land as long as the laws of the land don't counteract the laws of God. And God's law is a higher law. But God doesn't have a higher law than the speed limit in Branson West. And so you can't, you know, use this as an excuse. And I can tell you that from experience. We'll just drop it right there. I can't help it. I actually thought it was 45. But I, did, I just said, he said, you're going 45 and a 35. I said, yes, sir, you know. I don't, you, you, yes, sir. I didn't say I thought it was 45. And I didn't do this number. I'm a minister of the gospel. Couldn't you give me a break? Anything I can't stand is poor mouth preachers. I mean, if I'm speeding... Give me the ticket if you're going to give me the ticket, and I'll pay for the ticket. And I didn't know the Lord was going to have me to admit it on Facebook Live and admit it across the nation and around the world, but I paid the fine. I paid the fine. So <laughs> this isn't talking about things like that. It's talking about people that want to accuse you. The enemy, Satan himself, that wants to accuse you. And the question is, 
Who is it that is worthy or qualified to do that? Do you know accusation is something that can just destroy people's lives? Not, not necessarily their outward life, but sometimes accusations against you. Remember when we were kids and we heard these say, uh, this saying, Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Now that sounds macho, but it's not true. The Bible says in Proverbs that words wound like a sword and go down into the soul. And when people accuse you, and it doesn't even necessarily have to be a major accusation. It can be just a little snide remark. But that's why the Bible said in the book of Revelation, when we get to heaven, Jesus said, the former things are passed away, and behold, I will make all things new. Why is that important? Because if you remembered the words that even a brother or sister said to you on earth, a special, well, I won't even go into that. 5,000 years into eternity, two people walking down the streets of gold meet. And if the Lord had not put away the former things, one of them would have said, you're the one that didn't like my dress. You're the one that made that snide remark. You're the one. Yeah. Have you ever noticed how you can remember the accusations and forget the compliments? You ever notice that? Well, I just don't like the way he sings. I don't like the way she worships. I don't like, you know, little snide remarks. And, and it may be even jesting remarks. It may be something trivial. But people remember them. And those accusations work on their minds. That's why you don't need to hang with people that are constantly accusing other people. The Bible said avoid that kind of a thing. We know the devil is the accuser of the brethren. Sometimes your own mind will accuse you. Sometimes your own memory will accuse you. You say, well, Brother Mike, doesn't the Holy Spirit accuse us? No, he convicts us. There's a difference between conviction and accusation. Accusation is to hurt. Accusation is to wound. Accusation is to push away. But conviction is to woo. It's to draw. It's to bring back. It's to reconcile. Now, sometimes the conviction can be pretty harsh. Can I hear an amen? I mean, the Lord can take you to the woodshed. But he's not an accuser. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 10. Accuse not a servant unto his master, lest he curse you and you be found guilty. That Hebrew word is a verb meaning to slander. It refers to uttering false, damaging statements against a third party. You'll see it in Psalm 101.5. God avenges this, according to the word, with destruction. Even a slave was not to be slandered to his owner. How many are getting the point that God does not like accusers? He doesn't like accusation. The Bible says seven, uh, six things God hates, and a seventh is an abomination to him. And what's the seventh? He that soweth discord among his brethren. Well, what sows discord among the brethren? Accusations. Don't allow the accusations of the enemy to mess with your mind and change your self-portrait. The enemy's not trying to get you to change what you believe about God. That's pretty set if you know the Lord. He's trying to get you to change what you believe about you. And so there'll be accusations. The enemy will do it. Demonic power will do it. People will do it. The press will do it. The culture will do it. The world will do it. Religion will do it. There's a lot of accusing voices. Romans 14.4. Who are you that judges another man's servant? 
to his own master he stands or falls. He will be holding up for God is able to make him stand. You've heard me say this before. I'm not going to be up here and call other men of God or women of God's names and say, boy, they're really missing it in this area. Even if they are missing it in that area, I'm not going to get up here and accuse them before God and before you. What am I going to do? I'm going to pray for them. They are not my servant. They are God's servant. I didn't call them. God called them. Well, Brother Mike, what if they're dead wrong in what they're teaching? Well, I'll teach what's right in the Word of God. I'll ask the Lord to help me if, if the Lord wants me to teach the truth, but I'm not going to talk about them. Don't be accusatory against your brother or your sister. Don't do that. It's important that you don't. The Bible says in the Old Testament that when you do, you incur God's, and it uses this term, wrath. And there is a difference between anger from God and wrath from God. The word wrath literally means this, to reach a boiling point and boil over. Can I help you with this? You don't want God to boil over. There's a verse in Ezekiel that says this, my fury shall come up in my face. You know what that means? You ever been around somebody that, that eventually they've had too much and you can kind of see they're turning red from the top of their collar and it goes up to the top and when it hits the top, stand back? That's what he said in Ezekiel. He said, I don't like accusations. Folks, let's be blessings to one another. Amen? You say, well, pastor, is that going on? Are we accusing one another? Not that I know of, but if the shoe fits, wear it. Better yet, throw it away. Get a new pair. Let's bless one another. Let's encourage one another. Let's find something good to say about one another. You say, well, Brother Mike, I'll tell you, the person standing behind me and praise and worship couldn't carry a tune in the bucket. And uh, it just, you know, they just, but they sing loud. Well, then rejoice because they're obedient. They're making a loud noise and rejoicing. And the Bible said to do that. Well, Brother Mike, it bothers me. Well, move or sing louder yourself. Say, Brother Mike, I need a resolution to that. Yea, move or sing louder. <laughs> you know, folks, most accusations we make against one another don't amount to a hill of beans. Doesn't amount to a hill of beans. Do you know what most church splits in the American church is over? Nothing. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. I had one of my young pastors years ago, and they were in a building program. And um, they, they were doing great, and they were seeing people saved. They were in the middle of revival. They had to build because the church was overflowing, and new people were coming. People were getting saved all the time. And so they built, and then they made a great error. They decided that they ought to have a vote on the color of the carpet. So uh, this young pastor brought them all in, decided they were going to vote on the color of the carpet. So they had red carpet or blue carpet. And the reds would, you know, hung tight on the red. And the blue would rather be dead than red. You know, it, it's, they, it, they wouldn't give. They wouldn't give. And I mean, split that, that it, was a, it was a split vote. I mean, 50-50. I want red. We ought to have red, blood of Jesus. We ought to have blue, color of the high priest garment. They all had their scriptures, you know. And, and uh, he called me. He said, uh, he said, Pop. He called me Pop. He said, Pop, we're not having people saved. And the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit's not moving. And, and uh, I, I don't know what's happening. I said, well, tell me what you're doing. And he told me about the boat. And he said, people are all divided over the red and the blue. And then he said to me, what would you do? Well, that's the wrong question. Because what the Lord might have me do wouldn't be appropriate for what the Lord wanted him to do. But I said, son, you'll have to find, I'll pray with you, and the Holy Spirit will show you what to do. But he just kept asking me, he said, but what would you do? 
I said, well, son, you, you just need to pray and ask the Lord, and I'll pray. But what would you do? I said, well, since you're so insistent, I'd send all the money overseas, build six churches to evangelize in India or Africa, bring in folding chairs, and put them on cement floors with sawdust for about a year, and they'd be happy to get any carpet. See, because you know I'm the mean pastor. No, it's just stupid. It's just ignorant. Just foolishness. Stop the flow of the Holy Spirit over the stupid carpet. Stop God moving over the ignorant carpet. I was in a church one time. They almost had a split. Not a split, but there was a falling out among some of the people over taco chips. Are you ready for this? Taco chips. And one of them said, and it was for our socials, you know, our fellowships. And one of them said, well, you know, we can save 25 cents a bag on these other kind of taco chips. Right, they're two years old, and they're going to break molars out of your head. But that's all right. We believe in divine healing. Honestly. I mean, it actually had to come to the desk of the lead pastor. Which kind of taco chips should we buy? I didn't pray. I said, it's the king's business. Get the good stuff. By the best, this is the king's business. I don't want guests coming to the fellowship meeting and walking out with broken teeth over saving a quarter a bag. Come on, we don't have Jehovah Needy. We got Jehovah Jireh up in here. He can afford it. You know, put the kingdom of God. I get so old. Don't even get me started on that thing. I believe in being frugal, but I don't believe in being Ebenezer Scrooge. 365 days out of the year. We need God's business to be the best, the most excellent, the best technology, the best welcome, the best follow-up, the best love, the best buildings. We don't have, well, Brother Mike, what about the people overseas? Right, we're debt-free in this building, thank God for what all of you have done in following your leadership in the past. We'll be debt-free soon in the other buildings. Well, what are we going to do with what we've been paying? Baby, we're going to reach out. We're going to bless Israel. We're going to bless Africa. We're going to bless Asia. We're going to bless South America. And we're not going to wait until then. We're doing it now. Well, aren't you a little shaky over that? Not at all. And people get into all kinds of accusations with one another in the church, not even about the church business, just about one another. Folks, this is a trap of the enemy. Well, I didn't know I was going to really teach this long just on this point, but it's a trap of the enemy. Don't get into that. Don't get into that. But, but, but I just think they're talking about me. You don't know it, so quit worrying about it. But Brother Mike, I think they're talking about me. Well, praise God, you've drawn attention. <laughs> one of my mentors of my youth, C.M. Ward, stood in front of a class one day and he said, and he, I called him the Pentecostal W.C. Fields. He sounded like, you know, he said, and it was all guys in that class. And he said, fellas, have them love you or hate you, but don't have anybody neutral. <laughs> Now, I don't know if I pull that off. I don't like for people to hate me, and I'm not, I'm not working to twist people around to get them to love me either. I'm just going to love people and do what God's called me to do, and that's what you ought to do too. But stay out of this accusatory thing, folks. Don't get into this. Don't judge another man's sermon. Listen, friend, you don't know what they're going through. You don't know what they're facing. You don't know the pain in their life. I guarantee, and I used to teach my young preacher boys when I was teaching them Bible college, I said, every time you stand before a congregation, there is a broken heart on every row. There's somebody on that row that's walking through trouble. There's somebody that came and put a noble smile on their face and raised their hand and gave glory to God. But deep inside, they're walking through tunnels of despair and misery, and it's not up to us to judge them. It's up to us to love them and feed them and bless them and encourage them and lift them up. But what if they need correction? Well, you can do that in a loving way too. But stay out of this judgment thing. Stay out of the accusatory thing. It's important that you do that. Luke 
chapter 11, verse 53 and 54. And as he said these things unto them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to urge him vehemently and to provoke him to speak of many things. Why? Watch this. Laying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth. Watch. That they might accuse him. Let me give you a little bit of wisdom in, in personal relationship. Don't tell everything you know to everyone you know. I've had people say, you know, well, the Bible says confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Yeah, it doesn't say confess your faults to every one of the others. You better make sure it's a covenant relationship. You better make sure it's somebody that's really in covenant, really loves you, really loves God. Don't give access to everybody around you. Don't tell everybody your dreams. Come on, this is good teaching. Don't tell everybody everything about your dreams. Don't tell everybody everything about your visions. It doesn't mean they're bad people, but they're just not, you know, Jesus spoke to the multitudes one way, but he revealed more to the 70, but he revealed more to the 12 than he did the 70, and he revealed more to the three, Peter, James, and John, than he did to the 12. And he revealed more to John than he did anybody else. Well, didn't he love the multitudes as much as he loved John? Yes, he did. He died for the multitudes just like he died for John. But he did not treat them all alike. Why? Because he knew people were looking for his words to accuse him. I call it fishing. They're fishing. Come on, you know what I'm talking about? People ever work you? Come on. Uh-oh, we passed solid bar, haven't we? Come on now, chew. People work you, you know. What do you think? What do you think about it? I don't know. What do you think? What do you think? I won't tell everybody. I'm just telling you this about that person so you can pray. Lie. Come on. Accusatory. Don't get into that thing. Be careful. Be careful. Uh, I remember Dr. Murdoch one time said something that was brilliant. He said, he said to a group of leaders, business leaders and ministry leaders, he said, silence can never be misquoted. Now, come on, think about that. Brother Mike can do that in a short amount of words, you know. Silence can never be misquoted. You remember what Jesus did when he was standing in front of Pilate and the high priest a lot of those times? He didn't say anything. Didn't say anything. When they brought the woman caught in adultery and, and threw her down in front of him and said, Moses' law says stone him. What do you say? He didn't say anything. Silence can never be misquoted. He knew it was a hook. He knew they were fishing. The devil will do this. Not just people. The devil will do this. You ever have the devil try to get you into a conversation? Talk to Grandma Eve how that works out. Don't, don't, don't get into a conversation with the enemy. Don't do it. You can bind him by the power of the cross, the blood of the Lamb, the certainty of your covenant. Those are the three things I use more than anything else. I just say, oh, I bind that by the power of the cross, the blood of the Lamb, and the certainty of my covenant. I don't get into an engagement with him. There's no need for that. It doesn't solve anything. Or I'll just give him the word of God. Jesus didn't commune with him. He just shot him with the word. It is written. It is written. It is written. Or when he stood in front of Caiaphas and Pilate, for the most part, he answered some, but he kept silent. Be careful, folks, when the enemy, I'm trying to help you tonight and save you a lot of pain. Be careful when the enemy begins to accuse you. You're not all you ought to be. You're not where you ought to be yet. <laughs> well, I don't communicate a lot with you, but if you ever said that to you, just say, well, I'm going to heaven, you going to hell. I guess I'm ahead of you. Don't engage in a lot of nonsense. Oh, I don't take any, don't take any of that mess from him. Forget it, man. Yeah, but you know, 
you're not where you ought to be yet. <laughs> I'm, well, I'm getting a little cocky now. I'm thinking of some things to say back to him. I, I'd almost like to say, well, you're not either, but you'll slide into it one day. So, Brother Mike, what would the devil do? Shut up. I'm afraid of the devil. Well, you've lost the battle already. You've lost the battle already. I know some of you don't think this is crazy, but I'm going to tell you the truth. Those that are in the power of God and have the Holy Spirit in them and walking in God's grace don't have to fear any demon from hell. God hadn't given you a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. I fear things I don't know more than I fear any devil. I won't go into captivity because of what a devil tries to do, but I can go into captivity for lack of knowledge. I fear lack of wisdom more than I fear any devil. But Brother Mike, they're powerful. Oh, yeah. I love it when people say this, the devil is so smart. Yeah. Brilliant. Thought he could take God's job. Sharp. One of the dumbest creatures ever created in the universe. Brother Mike, don't say that. You'll make him mad. Mad fighters don't win. Knowledgeable fighters win. Anybody that's been in the martial arts or boxing knows that. That's why Muhammad Ali trash-talked his enemies. Joe Frazier would rock his jaw and he'd clinch him and say, my granny hits harder than that. And Joe would get mad and Joe would get knocked out. Stay in control. Understand that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And don't put up with accusations from the enemy. When he brings, boy, I'm feeling this tonight. When, when Satan brings accusations against you, use this Romans 8 verse. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Seeing that God has declared me guilty and shown me to be righteous. <laughs> you understand that? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? But what about when people do it? Don't engage. Don't engage unnecessarily. There's a time to engage when people are accusing you. But there's a time to ignore. I don't have this on PowerPoints, but come on, this is a little wisdom study tonight. Amen? Get a hold of this. Silence can never be misquoted. I already told you that. But don't engage. Don't engage Rabshakeh came accusing Hezekiah and Isaiah and the people of God. And God said to him, answer him not a word. Don't engage. Write this down. Your success in the kingdom will be more dependent on what you can ignore than what you can remember. I want you to grab that. Much of your success in the kingdom of God will be dependent on what you can ignore. Can you ignore the accusation of the enemy? Can you ignore the clucks from the chicken coop because they can't fly as high as you an eagle? Or oh, y'all quiet tonight. You understand what I'm saying? Well, Brother Mike, I just want everybody to like me. Look right at me. You in the wrong family. The Bible said the world hated me and it's going to hate you. So you might as well get used to that. Now, everybody in the world is not going to hate you, but there are going to be a lot of people in the world hate you. Why? You know Jesus. They'll be despisers of those that are good. What can you ignore? Special ops forces, I've been told, use this phrase. Ignore, override, press forward. Come on, grab a hold of that. Ignore, override, press forward. They even tell them when they're wounded, and their stories particularly about Navy SEALs that had severe wounds, but they ignored, they overrode, and they pressed forward. The corpsman wasn't there to help them, so they bound it, did the best they could, now, if Doc would have been there as the medic, they'd have been healed instantly. 
Every time I think about something like that, I either think about, I either think about Lee the corpsman or Doc the medic. So I didn't know Doc was a medic. Well, where were you during combat? I don't mean real combat. I mean the show combat. Wow. I got the whole seasons, all the seasons of combat delivered to my front door the other day. Doc, I can watch you day and night now. I got every season they make. And so I, I'm going to do that. I haven't got started yet, but I'm going to do that. But you know, they teach special ops, even if you get wounded. I, I, got, a hole, I got a hole right here. I got a hole in my side. I, I may bleed out. I better, maybe I better sit down. No. Bind it up. Ignore. Override. Press forward. Ignore. Override. Press forward. Well, somebody said something about me. Ignore. Override. Press forward. Somebody accused me of something that's not true. Ignore. Override. Press forward. The enemy said that I'm not what I ought to be. Ignore. Override. Press forward. I'm going to keep saying this till y'all join like a bunch of parrots. Come on. The enemy accuses you. Ignore. Override. Press forward. Say it again. Ignore. Override. Press forward. We're in the army of God. He said that he will bind up our wounds. He said that he will never leave. Ignore. Ignore. They're trying to get under your skin. Ignore. Override. I didn't say hate the accusers. Ignore. Ignore. Override. Press forward. It's so important that we learn these things. Put up the next PowerPoint, if you would, please, about accusation. Revelation 12, 10. I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. Watch this. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down. Watch which accuse them before our God day and night. Now, who is that? That's the devil, Satan. You know, he, he is accusing people all the time. He is a continual accuser. I don't know if I put this on a PowerPoint, I don't remember. But listen to it. When a person is an accuser, yep, when a person desires to be an accuser, they are actually trying to do the devil's job. Think about that. Now, let me ask you a serious question. How many in here don't want to be a satanic associate? I don't want to be a Satan's associate. What does he do? Accuse. So I'm not going to spend my time trying to accuse but they're not what they ought to be they ought to be doing that better they're not serving god the way they ought to be blah 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 no 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 when a person desires to be an accuser they're actually trying to do the devil's job and keep reading and when a person tries to condemn they're actually trying to do god's job he's the only one that has a right to finally condemn nobody else does now there's different words for judgment. One means to discern. We ought to discern things. One means to perceive. We ought to perceive things. But another one, and the one that's used most for judgment, especially in the New Testament, for con is condemnation. And the only one that has the right to ultimately condemn is God. So if I try to be an accuser of somebody, I'm trying to do the devil's job. If I try to condemn somebody, I'm trying to do God's job. How many know that I shouldn't be trying to do either? Shouldn't be trying to do either. It's important to stay away from accusation. Well, I was, um, while I was preparing for this, uh, the Lord reminded me, and I brought in my overcomer's manual, and I would refer you back to Isaiah chapter 54. And incidentally, if you don't have an overcomer's manual, I'd encourage you to get one. We supply it from the church. We pay for it. Every message I preach, every teaching I teach will go into this book. And uh, it'll be a wealth of material. And you know what will help you in it? Is if you'll go back and read these things again, occasionally, and highlight some of them. And you'll see things. 
I read things I said and think, man, I didn't know I said that. That was good. That's true. And he reminded me of promise 18 from Isaiah 54. I gave you, I think, 20 promises from Isaiah 54. Here it is. Every tongue that stands against you in accusation, you will show to be wrong. Isaiah 54, 17. Every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, you will condemn. Now, that doesn't mean condemn to hell or judge. It means to show to be wrong. Let me read to you something that we talked about. If you walk in obedience to the instruction of God's word and fulfill his assignment on your life, you will have critics and accusers. You will find them in the world and you will find them in the church. Jesus said, if the world hated me, it will hate you. Remember, it was religious people and leaders that accused him the most. He said, well, Pastor Mike, what do we do then about that? Here's what you do. Live your life before the Lord and before others in faith, hope, and love. Do your best to live a life of integrity, but that will not exempt you from criticism and accusation. Come on, did you hear what I said? You can do all those things right, but it will not immunize you against criticism and accusation. Listen to the next phrase. In fact, it will invite it. The more you do God's plan, the more the devil's going to try to accuse you. You ever hear people say, well, I'll tell you what, I've reached a place in faith, bless God, and the devil doesn't even try anything on me. No, you're asleep. You're asleep. The servant is not above his Lord. And the Bible said that the devil came to tempt Jesus. Jesus hit him with the word. And the Bible said the devil left him. But then there's another little, little snippet. The devil left him for a season. He came back around. Meaning he'll do the same to you. He'll tempt you again. He'll test you again. He'll try to condemn you again. He'll try to accuse you again. Let me keep reading Isaiah 54. Listen to some of the things they said about the Lord. He's born of fornication. Did you know that's what they said about Jesus? They said he's born of fornication. Well, since he was conceived of the Holy Ghost, they just called the Holy Ghost a fornicator. That was the accusation. They said, is he illegitimate? Then they said, he cast out devils by the prince of devils. They accused him of being demon-possessed. Now, this is the sinless Jesus. Then they said, nothing good ever comes from where he comes from. Nothing good ever comes from him. And then they said, he's a glutton and a wine bibber. He was neither, but they said he was. And then when he healed a blind man, and the blind man came and told the religious leaders, they said, glorify God because this man, Jesus, is a sinner. They called him a sinner. Now, some of you ought to get feeling better. Nobody's called you a sinner lately, a glutton, a wine bever, told you you were born of fornication, said you were demon-possessed, and said wherever you came from never produces anybody. That's just a few of the things. So, folks, it's going to happen. You're going to be accused. If you have confident faith, you're going to be accused of being arrogant. Just get ready for that. Just stand up and do this. I can do all things through Christ. Strength doesn't make. Who does he think he is? Who does she think she is? Stand up and say, I'm an heir of God and I'm an heir of God and join here with Christ. Well, who do they think they are? It's not arrogance. It can be. It can be. But a lot of times it's just confidence. It's confidence. Say something about how God's going to supply. God's going to supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. Even if diesel gets to be $5 a gallon, God's going to supply all my needs according to his riches. Well, well, he's pretty sure of himself, isn't he? No, I didn't say me. I said God. Come on, I'm not talking about me up in here. 
I've reached a place where I never leave the chariot of my assignment to chase somebody that threw a tomato. And that's a good place to be. Stay in your assignment. Stay in your assignment. I don't care what president is in office, wherever he goes, whether he's good or bad, there's going to be people holding up signs telling him what a, what a mean man he is, what a terrible person, what a failure he is, even if he did it all right. Come on, folks, I'm trying to help you. Because some of you, if there's the slightest accusation, you say, whoa, you get out of the chariot of your assignment and come, why would you say that about me? Can we talk? Let me help you. They say that about you because they're mean. They're accusers. Either that or they're hurt and they're wounded and they don't know how to deal with it and they need Jesus to help them. But don't leave your assignment. Boy, this is coming right out of me for somebody here tonight. And somebody watching ought to receive this too. Listen. Accusation is to get you to quit. It's to get you to quit. And it infuriates hell when you're in the chariot of your assignment and you're going down the road doing what God wants you to do. And the devil accuses you and you just go, giddy up. Somebody throws a tomato and you go, miss me. Somebody hurl, hurl, hurls an insult and you say, God help them. You know what their problem is. Bless them if you can, Lord. I pray for my enemies. Just keep stay in your chariot. Stay in your chariot. Don't get out in the mud with them. Don't get out and grab your own tomatoes. Vengeance is not yours. Vengeance is not yours. Don't worry about it. Now, there's times that, that confrontation is important. Sometimes, and I'm not teaching on this tonight, but I've never met a Jezebel spirit that responded to mercy. Never. It responds to confrontation. But the Jezebel spirit is not a person. It's a spirit behind a person. And you have to understand that. Man, I'm giving some leadership principles in here. We must have leaders in the house tonight. Amen? So don't, don't do that. And uh, let me read a little bit more what I taught from uh, Isaiah chapter 54. All criticism of Jesus, all those criticisms of Jesus were from religious people. He wasn't moved by any of it, so don't you be either. Stay in your assignment, fulfill your destiny. God can handle your critics. God can handle your enemies of His will in your life in a far more effective way than you can. Fly on. Eagle, fly on. Eagles don't. I've given you this illustration before. I like my eagle. Do you like my eagle? I wanted to share him with you. He's been in my office. But I said, man, you ought to be shared with the congregation. Because I believe FWC is a group of eagles. Amen. We're going to soar high. We're going to help people. We're going to minister to people. We're going to love people. And, um, and so I brought him out for at least a little while. But do you know what a golden, this is a bald eagle. And, uh, but a golden eagle, a golden eagle. Zoologists tell us, and those that study particularly fowls, tell us that he has three lenses on his eye. And he's the only, only creature in the earth that has those kind of lenses. And one lens can come down and protect the optic nerve from the brightness of the sun. How many know you can't stand and look into the brightness of the sun? Don't ever try it. I don't care if you got on blue Maui sunglasses. It's not going to work. Uh, it's, you, you don't do that. But a golden eagle. Have you ever seen a bald eagle or a hawk or a golden eagle? And they'll be flying. And these little birds. Have you ever noticed? And the little birds will come in like fighters. You know, to the bomber. And they'll, and they'll peck him. Boom. Well, the truth of the matter is a golden eagle. Listen, I'm talking about a golden eagle. A golden eagle, they have video of him going down and picking up a bighorn sheep in his talons and flying him over the edge of a cliff and dropping him to his death. 
and then going down and eating him. I mean, these are powerful birds. So that golden eagle has the ability, the agility, the dexterity, and the strength to just turn around, grab the bird, that little bird, and <laughs> crush it. Sound pretty good. <laughs> crush it. He never does it. Never does it. You'll spend all your life Dealing with the little birds. <laughs> you know what the golden eagle does? The, the bald eagle can't. But the, 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 the bald eagle will fly just higher. The golden eagle will fly higher, but the golden eagle does something different. That lens comes down over his, over his eye. And he turns directly toward the sun. And he can fly directly focused into the sun. And the birds that try to follow him while he's going higher, beholding the glory, get blinded. And they can't find him. They can't find him. The glory of the sun. And in fact, people that have studied golden eagles, and I need to go back and study them again. I did this years ago. But people that have studied golden eagles say that they have actually noted that these golden eagles, when they start flying in toward the sun, directly toward the sun, that it produces a euphoria in them. And almost it's almost like a, a high, a drug high in them. And as they look into the sun and as the enemies are confused behind them, they, they suddenly start diving and swooping and turning and enjoying life. Folks, I mean, tell you something, that ought to make an Egyptian mummy want to shout. Hallelujah. You get a hold of that? But Brother Mike, the enemy is, the enemy's pecking at me. Fly higher. Behold the glory. Look at the Son of God. Hallelujah. Oh, he's the S-O-N, but he's the S-U-N. He's full of the glory of God. Just keep flying high. Don't spend your time turning. Don't do that. You don't want blood on your hands. Don't turn around. Don't turn around and try to run them off. Just ignore, override, press on, press forward. He just says, oh, it's those little accusers again. And the accusers behind are doing this, flying into one another. Come on, am I telling you the truth? How many times do you read in the Old Testament when the people of God came under attack by enemies and they got a hold of God, what did God do? He created confusion in the enemy's camp and they began to run into one another. Amen. Now folks, don't, don't, don't get into hatred. Don't get into bitterness. Don't get into vengeance. And if you're a warrior, you'll have to discipline yourself in this. Because a warrior's first response is, <laughs> you're looking for trouble? You come to the right place. That's the first response. But it's not always the best response. Sometimes confrontation is what is required. Particularly if you have to protect someone else. But if it's just they're aggravating you, accusing you, ignore Override, press forward, ignore, turn toward the glory, rise higher, get your eyes on the Son of God, and all of a sudden that which blinds your accusers. Shoot, I'm about to preach myself happy up here. What blinds your accusers puts you into euphoria. Hallelujah. Listen, friend, what does it matter what some people that don't know you Think about you. Or oh, what does it matter even people that may know you, what they think about you and their accusations when God knows you, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And He loves you unconditionally. Keep your eyes on Him. And listen, the whole purpose of it, and I keep saying it again. Boy, I didn't know I was going to spend so much time on this tonight. But are you receiving this? He wants you to quit. The purpose of accusation is to get you out of your chariot. 
The purpose of accusation is to get you to give up not only on God, but to give up on you. And just make up, my, make up your mind and say, I'm not going to quit. I'll ignore. I'll override. They said he was born of fornication, but he kept going to the cross. They said that he was a wine-bibber and a glutton, but he kept in the chariot of his assignment. They said all these things about him, but he kept going until he's nailed to a cross and said it is finished and rose from the dead and ascended on high and he's coming back. No accusation stopped him. No accusation ought to stop you. Just In fact, do you know the Bible? You know what Jesus said about this? Lord, I'm getting revelation as I go. You know what Jesus said about this? He said, he said, blessed are you men, when men revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. And you know what he said to do? Land, get out of your wings. Get out of the chariot. Go try to talk to them about it. Go, go argue with them. About it. Go take vengeance. No, no, no. He said, when they do this, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. And then he added a P.S. They did the same thing to the prophets that came before you. Hallelujah. I'm just not getting enough shout tonight, so I'm going to give it a little of my own. Woo! Glory to God. Hallelujah! Brother Mike, I don't like it when you do that. Stop accusing me. I'd like to have some fun with you in the kingdom of God. I don't think the kingdom of God ought to be boring. There's a time for solemnity. There's a time for dignity. I understand that. But there's a time to get up out of the mother grubs and quit worrying about what people are saying about you. And just listen and hear what God is saying about you. You're my beloved. I love you with an unconditional love. I've chosen you. I've saved you. I've redeemed you. I've reconciled you. I've justified you. I've sanctified you. Shoot, I'll lose all my doctoral dignity up in here. I don't care. I'm going to tell you, God's been good to me. Yeah, but Brother Mike, what if some of the accusations against me are, are, are right? What if somebody's accusing you and they're right? Well, you failed back there. You did that. You shouldn't have done. You didn't do what you should have done. Hey, baby, welcome to the human race. Thank God for the blood. Hallelujah. Thank God for redemption. Thank God for grace. Hallelujah. And what you've received from Him, give to others. You know, give them a little grace, man. Give them a little grace. There were times when you accused others, maybe. Give them some grace. Just don't spend a lot of time. Just keep going. Just keep going. Praise God. Put up the next one. Romans 12, 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Now I want you to look at that verse. I want you to look at it carefully. carefully. Avenge not yourselves. Listen. That's the problem with accusation. The devil, oh, this is strong. <laughs> the devil will accuse you, but it's not really about you. He will accuse you to get you to quit your assignment in the kingdom that is going to affect other people. He already knows. He's lost you. He already knows you're walking with the Lord. You're serving the Lord. You're not going to give up on Him. I mean, the devil's not omniscient, but he's, you know, been around a while. He knows. So what he works on is not to get you to try, 
Oh, he'll tempt you to, and, and, and if he could get you to backslide, he would. But, but he knows that's not going to work. I mean, you know, most of the time the devil is not coming to believers that are walking in the Word and say, go rob a bank. You know, go do some terrible. No, he comes with accusations. They're subtle. He knocks on your door, and when you open it, he's not standing there in a red suit with, you know, a pitchfork and a forked tail. No, it's subtle. It's subtle. You know, I'm just telling you this for your good. I thought about it a long time. You know I love you, but I just want you to know and blah, 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 blah. It's subtle. It's subtle. And if you're not smart, if you're not perceptive, this is why I taught so long on walking with the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, when you walk with the Holy Spirit, you can smell a skunk before you ever see him. You can, you, <laughs> boy, I wish I could put it in words. The Holy Spirit is so brilliant. Oh, I wish someday the Lord had enabled me. And he's equipped me a lot with words. And I'm kind of a wordsmith, and I'm grateful. And it's not me, it's him. And I understand it's a gift from God. But I cannot tell you in words what I know about the relationship you can have with the Holy Spirit. He's brilliant. He's perceptive. He's discerning. He's sensitive. He's never surprised. He's never taken aback. He's never shocked. Not at your failure, my failure, other people's accusations, their failures. He's never shook. Ever. He's the steadiest person in your life. He is the same constantly. Sometimes when I'm teaching on, the, uh, on another subject other than the Holy Spirit, and it's happening right now, if I mention Him and start talking about something He may do, I could go over here and stay there for about 10 weeks and teach on relationship with the Holy Spirit. Friend, if you want for accusation not to move you, get close to the Holy Spirit close to the Holy Spirit. He's the one that constantly turns your eyes toward the Son of God, toward the glory. If you're not careful, the little birds will grab your attention. Your own spirit will accuse you. Did you know that? Your own mind primarily will accuse you. You're not what you ought to be. You don't do what you ought to do. If you'd have done this different, if you'd have yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I'm saying? He said, well, how do you? I mean, if you're accusing yourself, how do you handle it? It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. I got to close here. Wow. Doug, come on up. Imagine this with me, and I'm done teaching. Paul the Apostle is standing in front of people in Ephesus or Corinth, or for that matter, in Antioch where he first started teaching. And he's teaching, love one another fervently with an unfeigned love. And on the fourth row is a widow and her children, whom Saul of Tarsus, Put to death. And do you not think that the devil didn't accuse that man constantly? <laughs> you used to be a murderer. You separated the church. You, you, you. I think that's probably why the Holy Spirit told him 
my grace is sufficient for you. Can you imagine? And yet on that third or fourth row, whatever I said, the grace of God is manifested so greatly that they are able to, to no longer hear the accusations against Saul of Tarsus and embrace the apostle Paul. Now, my friend, that's grace. <laughs> Hallelujah. I said, that's grace. There's no way you can do that. There's no way you can do that. You can't reach that level of forgiveness. And so I just came tonight to tell you, if you do what God tells you to do, you're going to have accusers. You know, this beautiful couple that will get married next week, and we put them through the mill. I mean, man, if you got John Davis, Ken Rensick, you know, Ken and Pam and, and, and John and Deb and Mike and Karen Brown, that's not premarital counseling. That's torture. We, <laughs> but it's good torture. It's good torture. And, uh, but they have a great ministry ahead of them. Yes, they do. Amen. And uh, many, 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 God's going to raise up a new Caleb and Joshua generation in the Thank remnant. You, and we're going to love them and we're going to train them and we're going <laughs> to... Somebody, somebody mentioned Hector the other day. And he said, man's like your, like your Pastor Mike's shadow. And they weren't saying it accusatory or anything. He said, no. He said, well, yeah, kind of. But he said, he's allowed me to be his armor bearer and I'm learning. He said... He said, I'm learning. I'm just, I'm standing by him and I'm learning. And I'm listening. And I'm watching. And he won't be the only one. And every one of you have something to give and mentor someone in the faith. All of us are disciples. We're not just disciples, we're disciplers. But when you do that, precious son and daughter, all the accusations will come. You know, you'll accuse yourself. People will accuse you. The devil will accuse you. Ignore, override, press forward. Stay in love. Don't get out of the love walk. And don't try to take God's place in this verse. Don't try to take God's place. Brother Mike, is, isn't confrontation needed? Confrontation sometimes is needed to protect others. Particularly if you're in leadership. If you're in leadership on your job and accusations are being made at the, of the people under you, you have a responsibility to protect and sometimes that requires confrontation. Sometimes it requires a CEO firing somebody if they don't change. Okay? You're in leadership in your family. And one sibling is accusing the other. Confrontation may be required in a number of ways. However the Lord leads you. If you're in spiritual leadership. But notice what it said. Help me to finish, Lord. Avenge not yourselves. He didn't say, don't protect the people under your stewardship. That's different. That's different. He said, avenge not yourselves. When the accusation comes against you, don't, don't, don't get out of the chariot. Say, Brother Mike, why are you spending so much time on this? I don't know. I intended to get to the condemnation thing, but I'm not going to tonight. The Holy Spirit wants you to hear this tonight. The Holy Spirit wants you that are watching on Facebook Live to hear this tonight. Don't get out of the chariot of your assignment to face the people that threw the tomatoes. Don't. Just give them some grace. Move on. Just go on. Just, just go on. Just go on. Avenge not yourselves. Rather give place unto wrath. Listen. Wrath is a work of the flesh. Anger isn't. Wrath is. And if you allow wrath to get in you, 
And I'll tell you something. If you've got a warrior spirit, you better watch it. I do have one. And I know it. And I know it's a strength to protect people under my stewardship. I know it can be a great weakness if I give place to wrath. You better know your weakness as well as you know your strength. Well, Brother Mike, you finally confess. You, you have to watch that. Don't mess with me. I'll get in the word of knowledge and tell everybody in here what your weakness is. All of us have it. And, there, I mean, there, and, and, and God's given me the ability with words. When I was in sixth grade, they, we had aptitude tests at that time. And if I remember right, I scored at a, either a sophomore or junior in college level in vocabulary. I knew how to use words. And it's not me. I'm not that smart. It was a gift of God. Why? Because I'm an author and I'm a teacher and I'm a speaker and I'm a preacher. I needed words. But, but when you know how to use words, you can mince people up with words. And sometimes some mincing is required in protection, but not to avenge yourself. Come on, I know I've gone past eight a little bit, but come on, don't accuse me. I've gone too long. Don't avenge yourselves. Why? That's God's job. And let me help you with this. And I don't know who it is. All of us can learn from this tonight. Amen. But there's somebody watching me, particularly in leadership on, online, whether you're watching it live or you're going to watch the repeat. I don't know which it is. But, but young man, give, don't give place to wrath. I know you think you're justified in it. And you may be in the natural. But if it's just about you, Ignore, override, and press forward. But let me, let me promise you this, son. Vengeance is God's. He will repay. Don't ever doubt it. Don't get into the repayment business. That's God's business. Hardest verses in the Bible. Love your enemies. Pray for those that despitefully use you. Bless them that persecute you. Lord, you start reading that, you want to jump over to Ephesians and the whole armor of God. I mean, wow, that's heavy. We only do that by the grace of God. But let me say this to you and then I'm done. Don't ever doubt that God will handle your accuser. God will handle your accuser. And your main accuser is the devil, and God can handle him. He's handled him a long time ago. He's put him under his feet, and you're seated with Christ. Let me tell you something else. If you're doing what's right, and you're living right, you're serving God, and you're doing your best, God can handle people that try to get you out of your chariot. And listen to me in closing. Don't hope he will. Don't live for the day. Don't pray. You said you will repay, so payday is here. Don't, don't just let it go. Let it go. In fact, here's what you pray. And you'll have to discipline yourself. Come on, man, this isn't, this isn't just revival stuff tonight. I, last Wednesday was revival stuff, and I love the revival stuff, but this is wisdom stuff tonight. Listen, pray this way, Lord, if you can help them in your mercy. I don't know what motivates them to do it. It may be a hurt, it may be abuse, it may be pain that they've suffered. I don't know why they lash out at people. I don't know why they lash out at me. That's the way you need to pray. But Lord, if you can reach them in mercy, if you can reach them in grace, Father, forgive them. 
they know not what they do. And pray that way for the Lord to do it. And hope that the Lord can reach them in mercy. But if they will not respond, the Bible says, he that hardeneth his neck, stiffeneth his neck, will suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. That doesn't mean that God will kill them necessarily, and we don't want that. But he'll cut them off. He'll remove their influence. Our God is an awesome God, and he's going to protect his own. You receive anything tonight? You receive some stuff? I want you to feel good about your ability to stay in your chariot. Just stay in your chariot. I really haven't got a chance to meet y'all, but I feel that when I say that. Just stay in your chariot. Stay in your assignment. Stay in the dreams God's given you. Stay in the opportunities God's given you, the ministry God's given you, the direction. He'll direct you. He'll guide you. You'll know His voice. And don't let the accusations of yesterday or people get you out of the chariot. It'll just set you back from reaching your destiny. Stay in the chariot. Praise God. Stand up or I'll teach another hour. Praise God. Stand up. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Come on, lift up both hands and just praise Him a little bit. Come on. Come on, before we leave, lift up both hands. Just praise Him a little bit. Oh, thank you, Master. Oh, thank you, Master. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, Lord, make us like you. Make us like you. Make us more like you, Lord. Make us more like you. Grace us, Lord. Grace us. Grace me. Grace Karen. Grace everybody here, Lord, to be more like you. Let us not, Lord, try to do the devil's job and accuse. Let us not try to do your job and condemn and judge. Give us the ability to give place to wrath and release people in love to you, to you, to you. And you take care of them. We ask in mercy and love in the name of Jesus if they will allow you to serve. In Jesus' name. I want you to look at me, and then I'm going to let you go. You've been a good audience tonight. And uh, this was more a teaching time tonight. And we're going to flow with whatever God wants us to do. Sometimes it'll be revival. Other times it'll be teaching. Other times it'll be evangelism. God's a God of infinite variety. I was talking with Brother Kilpatrick today on the phone for a little while. and We were sharing together. And... Uh, he said to me, he said, you know, he said, I think we've about got this counterattack whipped and we're moving into what God has next for the church. And I said, I agree, my brother. I believe that. I sense that with all my heart. And I believe it. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. When the commander says, let's go. When commander Jesus says, let's go. Don't be wandering off somewhere from your chariot. Trying to find somebody that threw a tomato. Stay in your chariot. So at a moment's notice, you're able to move forward in the kingdom of God. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Stretch your hand out toward me. I want to bless you tonight. I want you to look at me. I want to, I want to bless you. Put your hand down. The Lord just told me to do something else. Then I'll bless you. Never fear the spirit that is behind accusation. I don't know why the Lord said, don't you let them out of here before you tell them this. Never fear the demonic spirit that is behind accusation. You have authority over that spirit. I said you have authority over that spirit. And you take your authority over that spirit. And tell them I'll not be moved by you lying devil. I've taught you to be kind to people. I want you to be rough as a cob to demonic spirits. 
don't you mush mouth around with some Adonijah Jezebel spirit that's trying to manipulate you and intimidate you. Love people, forgive people, and bind that power that's behind them and let them know you're a mighty warrior of the living God and you won't take any of their demonic guff. Glory. Now, stretch your hand out and I'll bless you. Father, I bless them in the name of Jesus with freedom from self-incrimination because of accusations that have been in their life. Whether it's current or whether it was years ago, whether it happens tomorrow or next month, I just pray, Lord, that you will immunize them away from accusation having any effect on them. Give us the love of God, the grace of God, and the courage of God as we stand for you. We receive it right now in the name of Jesus. Come on, give the Lord a clap offering of victory.